This is Trish, uh, end of life doula here in Anacortes, Washington. And in this video, I would like to address another part of the advanced directive that is available in Washington. And that is a separate document that is specific to what your wishes are regarding being fed forcefully or, or hydrated um, against your wishes. So should you develop dementia or Alzheimer's, um, oftentimes people with those conditions start to forget to eat. Uh, they start to not desire to eat. Um, they lose their appetite and they're not as interested in eating and drinking. And oftentimes this causes sort of a medical emergency because obviously if you're not taking in sufficient food and drink, you're going to die. So families often willfully decide, make a big decision and decide to take matters into their own hands and make sure that mom gets her nutrition uh, through um, what we call forced feeding or nasal feeding, NG tube. So um, there are many types of uh, tubes that are used um, to artificially um, provide nutrition and hydration. Uh, the most common being what I said, the NG tube, which goes in through your nose, down the back of your throat and down to your tummy. So it bypasses the whole procedure of chewing and swallowing. And um, it's often prescribed temporarily for people who are having difficulty swallowing doing to, due to an accident, cancer, things like that. Um, NG tubes are very temporary. They are uh, usually only used for a couple of weeks. It starts to cause problems with the throat, having a tube down your throat. Um, obviously, NG tubes are not really very useful if you need to be ventilated. <laughs> um, so, because it, we, we basically have, you know, an esophagus and a larynx and they go in the same basic way <laughs> down. <laughs> so, they both go through the opening of the throat and then, you know, one branches to your lungs and one goes to your tummy. So, <clears throat> it's, it's problematic with other kinds of treatment. Um, it's also uncomfortable. Um, if you can even imagine having a tube placed up your nose, and yes, you are totally conscious when that happens because you have to help by swallowing. Um, and it's not something that's necessarily going to do anything for a person who's that far gone. So again, it comes down to what is quality of life to you versus what is quality of life to your loved ones. And often quality of life to your loved ones is, well, she looks fine. Let's just keep her alive. That's not necessarily what you would wish. Um, so we do have a form here in Washington where you can deliberately and on purpose say, should I have a condition that causes me to not desire to eat, I do not wish someone to force me to eat. And that, you know, it's very specific in the form that, you know, if you turn away, if you, um, if you spit food out, if, if you show no interest in eating, um, there's a, a, a very realistic criteria that you can modify. Um, to what would be truly, I don't want to eat and what that means to you. If I don't want to eat, um, this brings up the qu another question and that's about uh, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, which is often a very ill person's only way to bring death on faster, which is to just choose not to take nutrition or hydration um, so that they don't linger. Um, and that is understood by the medical community as it's your right. It's your right to refuse to eat. It's your right to refuse to drink. And um, oftentimes that's the only way that someone can bring about the end when they seem to be lingering and they're in pain or, and in the case of dementia, it's, it's back to quality of life. 
Now, quality of life means very different things to very different people. And it's every individual's decision and no one should influence that. And that includes the people who love you, who want you to stick around because they don't want to lose you. And so they're holding on to that very tightly. But there comes a point where you need to make those decisions about yourself. There comes a point where those decisions directly affect how you're going to spend your last hours, days, weeks on this planet. And again, it's one more invasive and potentially very uncomfortable thing to have to go through. And it may just be, again, prolonging death versus prolonging life. So I invite you to give a really good long thought to that. Um, another thing that I want you to consider, and this is in regards to your advanced directive to healthcare as well, is it is always permissible for you to put a limitation on the length of time you're willing to endure a particular treatment. You can say, for example, in your advanced directive, if I have no response to life-saving measures for three days, that's it, pull the plug, let's stop. You have the right to make those kinds of decisions in your paperwork and lay them out in a legal way that defends both you and your healthcare provider legally from any responsibility other than your responsibility to your own self and to what you desire. And you have legal rights to pursue or to choose not to pursue health treatment. So please consider this long and hard that you can put in your advanced directive that I may be willing to do uh, temporary nutrition, um, but I don't want to be permanently um, on, on what we call artificial nutrition or enteric nutrition. So um, they can actually put a hole direct, directly into your abdomen, into your stomach, and feed you that way. And many people are dependent on that um, forever. Uh, but for many people, eating and drinking is part of the enjoyment of life. And if that is something that's outside your reach, would you still feel like you had quality of life? These are very deep and personal questions, which is why I invite you to really give it some thought before you commit things to paper. If you're ready to commit things to paper, um, again, End of Life Washington has the form that uh, gives specific instructions for end of life. Well, not for end of life. It's for if I am in a healthcare facility and um, this is what I am willing to have as far as oral or enteric feeding and, and hydration. So uh, those forms are available to you. Um, it's another form that needs to be witnessed. Uh, not having it notarized is optional, but it needs to have two witnesses. So again, this is gonna require a little effort at this point, since we're dealing with COVID-19, it's gonna involve like a Zoom meeting where everybody signs where they are and everybody witnesses that it's done that way. So it does take a little more work right now to do these forms. But if you have any questions regarding the implications of these things, which is really the most important thing to me, I want you to truly understand all your options with regard to the kind of medical care you get. And if you have that all written down on a piece of paper, should something happen to you, whether it be illness or injury, you're going to have your have a better chance of your wishes being followed. Now, there's always a chance they won't be. I'm not going to lie to you. But you're going to have a much better chance if you have everything documented and, and signed, sealed, and delivered. This also needs to go to your physician, your reg regional hospital, to your healthcare agent, and you should have a copy of your, yourself. So it goes right along with your advanced directive. Um, in our next talk, we're going to talk about the coup de gras of advanced healthcare directives in Washington State, which is the Washington State healthcare directive regarding Alzheimer's and dementia. And that's a big one. We might have to do that one in a couple of stages, but we will address it. So keep staying safe and get your paperwork done so that your loved ones have a way to navigate the end of your life. 
Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.